unfull screen in the Shadow PC. Let's bring up our discussion, or no, our interview with Yoshi B, not our RPG Sites interview. Let's see here. Um, oh boy, same time zone. Yeah, yo. Let's see here. Uh, will Trust be retrofitted uh, for early game? That's a great question. I hope so. I think it needs to happen. I think if it does happen, if, and this is the kind of key thing, like you gotta you gotta recognize the like they actually in patch four point four, they recoded how the Chocobo companion system works, and with that concept, with that change, I should probably get to safety because I'm just out in the field. Safety can be just flying in the air. Let's just do that. Okay, so they did that. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of work for the dev team to do it. One of the great things, like when you see hats, glasses, headgear for Viera and Harothgar, um, that's the dev team just kind of going the extra mile. Like, it's so fun that, like, we typically can easily make the mistake of, oh, it's just easy. Another game does X. Go do X. Go do Y. Go do Z. Okay, go do that. Uh, sometimes it's not as easy. We, uh, You look at the history of, of 14 and how they had to remake it and how they had to rebuild it. You know, a lot of things were done just for the sheer sake of it, like, you know, the companion system. So they, they redid it. Now, no no visible benefit to us right now. So trusts can exist in the new expansion, but for them to go and retrofit that, same thing with the, like, just think of it as the fate change. Like, we have fates with the kind of the shared fate system. It's easier for them to do that going forward than it is to go back. So if it does come to the to previous stuff, that hopefully the community receives it with like ju like as a as a love letter, you know, f because that's what the that's what they're doing uh, when when they do it. So I think that it has to happen. I don't think it's the number one priority. So I think it's good. they're going to look at it over the course of years and start bringing that back in. And maybe they start with ARR. I mean. If you think about it, like, do you work from Stormblood backwards or do you work from ARR forwards? I think it needs to happen. I think when you look at the game and you look at ARR and you look at the, the challenges that, you know, people have, when you look at people, you know, like, oh, okay, like, if the only option is to do is a jump ocean, that's kind of heartbreaking. And a lot of the community who really feels that the, um, you know, feels that the, the game and the story are that important... Like you can lose out on that aspect and you can end up creating tension within the community itself just because somebody who wants to come play the game, they're like, oh, I heard Shadowbringers is amazing. Wait, how many hours do I need to play? <laughs> uh, you know, so it's like if they can kind of, you know, get that working, get the trust system built into those things, uh, I think you can see that. Now, maybe in the next two years, most likely you could kind of start to see that expansion by expansion. So ultimately we'll have to wait and see. So definitely like Chronicle says, not anytime soon. So Mark's asking, is the daily grind going to be run exclusive by you or can we expect to see Chris hosting every often? It depends on Chris's schedule. It could literally be uh, more than just a kind of a Tuesday, Thursday thing. But when Julie and I sat down and kind of were looking at our content schedule for the, the channel, it was like, well, we have the community game night on, on Monday nights and then I have a raid night on Tuesday nights. And then I go and we all play together uh, Halo on Wednesday nights as, as a group. And usually by Wednesdays, I'm just exhausted. And Julie was like, you know, like we, you know, like we want to see you more. And so essentially the, the, the concept of the day of the grind for me is me saying that if I do stream in the evenings, it's going to, that's just going to be a bonus stream. And that might be how like Chronicles is a, like a green. So we have our member, member goal, like that's above my head or whatever, where we would actually say, cause one of the things that we have as a part of the perks for being a member is that we're going to have member exclusive streams. Like you have to X be, you know. Like only members can chat, everybody can watch, but you know, in that regards. And so maybe we'll shift my evening bone and those are just bonus streams. Like let's say the kids are all asleep or Julie's got the kids down in Fort Worth and I'm, you know, solo for the night here. Um, well, let me, I might go live and, I might, and maybe make that a bonus member only stream or something like that. But to move my evenings back to being more family focused, uh, being, you know, not feeling like I need to be live on Mondays and, and Tuesday nights. And I honestly think it'll be better because I have a lot more energy in the mornings. Like right now, just like, man, I just, you know, finished my coffee, listen to music, hanging out with you guys. Uh, and so, yeah. And so as, as far as Chris's perspective, I'm, that's my thought too. Like, but I'm going to let him kind of see what works for his schedule rather than try to commit to it. And so when we looked at it, we said, hey, let's try Tuesdays and Thursday mornings. Let's see how it goes. And then after this, I'm, I go back to work the nice that's the strength of actually working from home so i'll go work on you know programming i've got plenty of plenty of things to code today but this is kind of a fun little break to where 
I kind of get the gaming out of my system in that regards. Uh, so I'm not sitting here like, oh man, like, because there's a weird pressure from a content creation perspective. Zane does uh, guides on uh, on uh, like uh, crafting and gathering. If you haven't checked out his channel, uh, go check it out. Click the, his name or whatever and go see if he's got some stuff that you might be interested in. And I'm sure maybe he can relate to it. It's like the, there is this constant like, oh man, I'm behind. I'm, I'm, you know, I need to be grinding. And then it's like, then it becomes less of a game and more of a job. And I don't like that. This is work to game, not the opposite way around it. So that's, that's kind of the concept of what we were thinking for the daily grind. And, uh, and so this is kind of the live show and then this will be archived. And maybe if it, if you guys like it, well, we'll go clip the different sections, right. And make them the, their own videos. I don't know. Ultimately this is kind of, you know, we'll, we'll see what you guys like. I mean, uh, <laughs> that's, that's the whole point to kind of figure out what works uh, and what people are enjoying uh, from, from the content itself. So, okay. Um, we're going to dive in now. <laughs> Welcome everybody uh, to the Daily Grind episode one again. Uh, in this case, we're going to be sitting here going in through an RPG site interview. Let me go ahead and copy this into chat for y'all. And let me make sure that it's a part of the description on this video. Let's see here interview rpg site enter can't spell can't speak sometimes either so there we go got that that should be updated shortly let me get my mixer chat back because i don't know why restream is not connected but either way so uh if you guys want to read along if you guys want to check out the, the article be sure to give these guys some love they're the they're the ones they're the source for the information uh and let's go from there uh, Chili says he had to leave Mixer for some reason. Stream is breaking up for it. May I wonder if uh, if Restream's having a problem? We'll have to see. We'll have to see. All right. So Final Fantasy XIV Shadowbringers just released a few months ago to unanimous praise. And at Gamescom 2019, we were lucky enough to be able to talk with, through a translator, the director and producer, Noki Yoshida, the main scenario writer, uh, Oda, about various elements of this highly acclaimed MMORPG. While the review is still currently ongoing, we were able to get a glimpse of how some of the fights in the Eden Raids were designed and asked some questions about some community issues. So RPG site asks, there are a lot of homages to previous Final Fantasy titles in Shadowbringers, specifically gestures from Final Fantasy IX, the Sin Eaters being reminiscent of Sin Spawn from Final Fantasy X and Zodiac, and the names of the Asians being derived from Final Fantasy XII. Were there any narrative elements you included from other Final Fantasy titles you felt enhanced the narrative of this expansion? So Oda says, So there are actually several essences that use homages to Final Fantasy Legacy titles. The first thing is that when the team decided to rebuild Final Fantasy XIV from the original 1.0, we received a lot of feedback from players that said it didn't feel like a Final Fantasy title, and that's important for us as an MMORPG. It is a strong community, a strong player base, so we wanted to encourage conversation among players because not everyone has played all the legacy Final Fantasy titles, and by giving Final Fantasy XIV the essence that we wanted to give them the opportunity to talk about whether or not playing the games, we wanted to integrate this together. I want to say it's not only the case that we just wanted to throw in ideas for essence from legacy titles because I'm not a fan of the Final Fantasy series that I've played. You know, sorry, one second. Essence from legacy titles because I am a fan of the Final Fantasy series and I have played everything. I think that protecting the memories that you have through playing the game is really important. Also, because not everyone has played all the previous Final Fantasy titles, the storyline for Final Fantasy XIV has to be digestible for everyone. That's absolutely the, the case. Absolutely. <laughs> Let's see. Yoshida says, Final Fantasy XIV has a story of its own, and that being said, we have this short, uh, sort of concept of XIV to be a theme park for the Final Fantasy series. We want to make it that as a platform that people from any generation or background could get together and share the same universe. So we're doing this deliberately. We also want to incorporate indirect elements that would give that sort of punch, that story of Final Fantasy XIV at its core of Final Fantasy XIV. So just because we have those elements, these are not the main focus. And that's, he said this numerous times, everybody, uh, on, it, it's, they're there to enhance, they're there to excite, but they're not the driving factor. And if they were, then I, you, you wouldn't have Shadowbringers. If they were, you wouldn't have the impact that this, of the story of Shadowbringers. Uh, and that's just, that's just where I fall. All right. So RPG has say, says the Eden content is some of the most exhilarating raid material thus far. How did you approach expanding already familiar mechanics in these fights that were present in a realm reborn with Leviathan and Titan for these new raids. 
So Yoshi says, we didn't want to make the mechanics completely different from the original fights. Taking Muhammad Prime, for an example, when we created this fight, we tried to research everything. What kind of attacks his enemy has and what kind of additions we should make. Can I say Muhammad? I'm wondering if, anyway. <laughs> Uh, make sure players recognize this as Bahamut. So we do everything thorough research before creating the encounter. Okay, I get the con. I was think I got confused with thinking like, did he mean Eden Prime? Okay, bah yeah, Bahamut. Still keeping the legacy, the mechanics, and the tax as part of their creation, the designers thought of more ideas to keep Final Fantasy XIV's Bahamut special along with the other primals. They would decide on the attacks. They should share damage with the players or the primal would crush the plate and the players would fall off the cliff. This is done for every primal encounter in 14 to retain that basic flow. The primals appear for a realm reborn, specifically Leviathan and Titan. So those designers that created the versions present in Eden, they researched the original mechanics and those primals had and tweaked and rearranged them in their own way to bring more excitement to the fight and to the players. This is how Eden, Leviathan and Titan came about. And by uh, taking a realm reborn primals by reference, we made something out, new out of the original content. What do you guys think about that? Like the fact that we have a Leviathan and Titan again. I'm going to sit because my my voice would give out. Glean, welcome to the workforce. Thanks for that follow button. Oh yeah, that felt good. <laughs> All right, we're going to continue on. Let me know if you guys have any questions or thoughts about any of the stuff that we're covering right now. So RBG site asks, the Final Fantasy 14 seems to draw inspiration to real world parallels to policies in history, with Ishgard primary being a theocracy and possibility of Amaro be, being read as a, a criticism of the Japanese bureaucratic system's inability to respond to natural disasters. Was this intentional? And if so, what message would you like to leave players in regarding to politics of this game? Oda says, rather than taking inspiration from current affairs and government systems, I'm a big fan of history, so I take some inspiration from history books. Even though I'm a fan of past games from the Super Nintendo era, the main demographic for Final Fantasy XIV is in their 20s or 30s, so I wanted to put something mature in nature and make it interesting for them. You use the Japanese government as uh, handling of natural disasters as an example. That wasn't a reference for Amuro, so I think uh, so. there isn't a link to the real-life politics. Yoshi says... Being in charge of Final Fantasy XIV as both the director and producer, I'm 46 years old, but I've also been a gamer since I was a child. I would sometimes get emotional or get inspired by these titles. I played as a child, but it, what's important is that if I play these games again, that I still feel the same way or I'm moved by the same things. Speaking of people, there is always a good and bad side to them, but everyone comes from different backgrounds, and because of these different backgrounds and beliefs and religions, they can all be different. This often leads to infighting or fighting and conflict. This makes real life complicated, and I want to bring this into the game to reflect this essence to make it more realistic. Oda says, Final Fantasy XIV's approach to reflecting real-world issues is influenced by Tactics Ogre. <laughs> there is an element of uh, massacre there that if I didn't play this game, the approach to Final Fantasy XIV's story would have been different. Tactics Ogre has a story that, in that includes uh, ethnic cleansing and greatly influenced my desire to to reflect real real world conflicts and issues that make 14 seem more realistic. Yoshi follows up, the any antagonist for Final Fantasy 14 will have their own background and reasoning. We don't have any intention to have a shallow or hollow antagonist. And this is where I think when we talk about <laughs> we're not going to go in real big spoilers here, but when we talk about um, when we talk about just the antagonist that they've had Shadowbringer says, I think, has has the best. He's the most interesting with them itself. He's the most complex. He's the most multidimensional. And I think the best villain is one that you can sympathize with. Now, you, you can you can chastise the, the actions, but you can sympathize with essentially the loss or the goal or the dri what drives them, what keeps them moving forward. So Chronicle said, Brian, did you do the Rising yet? Yes, I did. Uh, we actually have the Let's Play of the Rising up on our Work to Play channel link in the description we're not technically really promoting that yet nor am i promoting the ginger prime stuff so people are like oh you created a new highlights channel yeah uh we also created a lot of other channels just because um people have been asking for more like like different kinds of content and we're trying to find ways to do that without overwhelming it because people are like oh my gosh like you know I, my feed was just nothing but work to game today it's like yeah i get it <laughs> i get it uh, so Soro says, uh, just join in now. Uh, did you already go over the patch notes? Yes. In fact, you can actually rewind the stream on YouTube, Soro, so you can go kind of check out the patch notes and my thoughts on it, but we'll also make sure that the daily grind is published so people can watch it later. And that's the goal. And 
I might take the highlights of this of the stream and toss them on the work to play channel as well. So we'll we'll see. <laughs> we're we're figuring we're, we're doing it live. We're figuring it out as we go. All right, let's get this back in. So sorry, one second. There we go. So I don't cough like drastically. So RPG site says. Recently, there was an outfit released to both the Chinese and global servers that Korean community members have pointed out as being reminiscent of clothing wearing during the Japanese occupation of South Korea, which resulted in an online position being posted on change.org and various uh, users requesting Square Enix remove the outfit out of sensitivity to wartime events. Is there any comment you would like to make regarding this? And Yoshi P says, I would like to explain a bit by bit so everything can be explained completely. The concept of this outfit came from the Korean and Chinese publishers. They gave the development team in Japan and the suggestion to create the outfit. The request came from them, regardless of the historical background, they requested this specific design. The team in Japan already understood that this would be quite contentious so that they would be uh, people voicing their concerns because it is quite sensitive. We do know that there is a historical background attached to this and we tried to mitigate it and not to invoke the history of what happened before. This is why we tried to give it a neutral name and would not invoke the negative historical understanding to protect the community. When the outfit was completed and ready for release, the Chinese team made an announcement with the flavor text regarding it being re reminiscent of the Japanese occupation. This is because the Chinese team underestimated that there would be a particular amount of people in South Korea that would take it personally. And they said that that team in Japan didn't know what the Chinese team announced in the outfit that this flavor text in was out of our hands and out of our control. And we were very careful when creating this design. However, since it could be very risky. We uh, we just wanted uh, to reiterate that the team in Japan have no particular view or thoughts on certain historical events. Because of this, the team was discussing that it might not be a good idea to release it in the Korean version of the game. But there are also many people in South Korea who want this outfit and we received many messages from the customer service team about this as well. Because of this, we decided that we should admit and apologize for this mistake to the Chinese that the Chinese team made. But because there are so many people who are after the outfit, regardless of the region, we made the decision on releasing it. And that is, that is the interview, guys. That is that. So what do you guys think about that? Like, uh, like I have no real major connection to any conflict within Korea, within Japan, but that's just fascinating. Like, Yoshi P feels, at least if nothing else, comes off as, as one of the most thoughtful and just, like, really thought-provoking, uh, you know, uh, just engineers out there it's just his team is just incredible 